Here's a puzzle. Why is it that when we hear about an issue like racism, it's so often stories like these? Now we're gonna move on to our GMA cover story. It's a heated debate over a prom dress. See this young woman right here. She's being accused of cultural appropriation for wearing that Chinese-inspired dress. The fallout continues over H&M's coolest monkey in the jungle hoodie. This morning, Heineken taking some heat over a controversial commercial that many are calling racist. For many of those who care about racism, this media conversation doesn't feel representative of the bigger issues. Instead of discussing prejudice in areas like employment or criminal justice, we're debating prom dresses. Ideally, we'd see some overlap between the media conversation and the reality of the issue. Instead, we have this gap. Why is this? Another example might be the issue of sexual assault, where despite the system being pretty bad at bringing prosecutions, there are nonetheless each year hundreds of straightforward cases. Guilty pleas, no court battles. But the cases we hear about? New questions and doubts are being raised about the story of an alleged gang rape at the University of Virginia. Kavanaugh at first said it never happened, then today said he wasn't even at the party Ford described. Instead, we focus on discredited accusations or the harder to prove edge cases. Again, we have this strange gap. Serious issues, the conversation in the news and online. Normally, this gap is explained as the actions of conservative media or extreme activists. But this film is about a different way of understanding what's going on. An idea that explains this gap and that has, for me, completely changed how I see the news. Every day it seems like we have to endure one dumb culture war controversy after another. 140 million poor people and low wealth people in this country. And what are we talking about? Tweets, racism, it's all distraction and we're not talking about the real issues. All right, ready? I want to start things here with this video from 2014 of a guy jumping into Sydney Harbour holding a GoPro. As you might expect, the video went viral, gaining millions of views. But there was a problem. Starting to wonder after watching it a couple times, is this a fake? It is so fake, it makes my brain bleed. There, first time we see the shark on the right side of the screen. Okay, very close. Wait a second, the shark just teleported to the left. The video provoked a huge debate over whether it was genuine or not. A debate that continued for two years until finally, a production company came forward to admit it was a fake. But what was strange was that the flaws in the video, the mistakes people had spotted as proof it was fake, hadn't stopped it being successful. In fact, the flaws had helped, as the arguments they provoked generated hundreds of algorithm-friendly comments and shares on social media. As the article interviewing the filmmakers described it, the more people argued over the authenticity of a video, the more viral the video became. That is huge! That is absolutely huge! The company went on to turn this accidental discovery into a strategy, purposely making a whole series of videos that were just fake enough to generate back and forth comet wars and thus become viral. That same year, the writer Scott Alexander talked about this back and forth dynamic in his essay, Toxoplasma of Rage, in which he compared how internet stories go viral with the gross but kind of amazing parasite Toxoplasma. The way this parasite works is that it starts off living in a cat. The cat then poops it out until it ends up, via the water supply, in a rat. Once in the rat, the toxoplasma hijacks its brain, convincing it to hang out conspicuously in areas where cats can eat it. The parasite is then back in the cat, who then poops it out, rat consumes it and gets brain hijacked, cat eats the rat, and so the parasite passes from cat to rat to cat to rat and so on and so on. And so with comment wars on the internet, where one side says something which in turn provokes the opposition, whose response then provokes the first side to respond to them, and so on and so on. Stories that can provoke this toxoplasma of rage get a valuable boost, especially on an internet that rewards comments and shares. But to gain this boost, the story has to be such that both sides want to talk about it. And that means, and this is the key point for me, it has to be somewhat difficult or flawed. Think about it. In the shark video example, it was the fact the fake wasn't perfect that gave it such a boost. If the fake had been more sophisticated, no one would have noticed and commented on it. While too obvious a fake, and everyone can just see that, and there's nothing to argue over. To succeed, the video had to be in a central point between the two sides. Not ideal for either of them, but giving them both enough to argue over. The controversy sweet spot, you might call it. And it's this dynamic that pushes so many unrepresentative stories to the top of the national conversation. The stories that best represent an issue, and the activists would most like everyone to pay attention to, don't engage the opposition, meaning no toxoplasma of rage and no attention. 
but the stories that are difficult or borderline give both sides something to argue over. And boosted by the toxoplasma of rage, they rise to the top of the conversation. Welcome back. Tonight, a funeral was held for a New York City man who died in police custody. As an example of this phenomena, Scott Alexander looks at two police killings from the year 2014 and asks why the death of Eric Garner, killed after being put in a chokehold, received less attention, at least at first, than that of Michael Brown, who was also killed by police the same year. This was odd because the details of Garner's death were shocking. I will say that upon seeing the video that you just saw and hearing Mr. Gardner say he could not breathe, I was extremely troubled. I would have loosened my grip. I desperately wish the officer would have done that. In fact, the police actions were so horrific that even a conservative like Bill O'Reilly, who would normally defend the police, felt the need to condemn it. But the perverse consequence of this was less controversy, no toxoplasma of rage, and thus less attention. On the other hand, whether or not Brown had his hands up is one of the many contentious questions surrounding the story of his shooting. But little police have said differs sharply. There are conflicting reports about what led up to the shooting. For activists hoping to win over the public on the issue of police brutality, it seems the better case to focus on is Eric Garner's, the case even conservatives felt the need to condemn. Likewise, conservatives would have no doubt have preferred to focus on a story about a police officer being killed in the line of duty. Yet these stories only get one side posting, commenting and sharing. The less straightforward, more difficult case of Michael Brown, however, hooked both sides into arguing over it. Thus, a toxoplasma of rage and national attention. Good evening, everyone. We're coming on the air with the latest on the wave of protests and unrest taking place at this hour across the country. Now, of course, the toxoplasma of rage isn't the only dynamic that can gain attention for a story. The murder of George Floyd in 2020 got lots of attention, demonstrating the power of shocking video. And the Me Too movement was ignited by the Harvey Weinstein revelations, a story helped by the fact that so many of those involved were well known. But while both Black Lives Matter and Me Too started off focusing on stories that inspired wide political support, the way our attention economy is structured meant both issues were sucked towards the controversy sweet spot, leaving us debating the merits of defund the police or the more borderline, if still important, cases of wrongdoing like that of Aziz Ansari. I think this dynamic explains a lot about what's going on with so many culture war stories and why there's this big gap between the substance of the issues and the arguments that seem to dominate the news and social media. But what's so exasperating about all this is that it undermines the efforts of movements like those against racism or sexual assault to actually achieve change. Sure, people are talking about the issue, but what they're being exposed to are the controversy sweet spot stories, which are exactly those stories it's hardest to build a consensus around. After all, it's the divisiveness of these stories that has pushed them to the top of the agenda. And any time we do find something we can all agree on, the story is sucked towards that controversy sweet spot, where we all start arguing again. So next time you see a must comment political story or even a controversial viral video, that might be something worth remembering. Ah!